being able to, to work with them on some projects in this area. I think we should be good to go. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Good. Let's see if there's a quick All right. Sorry, just use your camera on the laptop. Sorry about that. So, yes, my name is Lee. I'm a townie of Oxford, Ohio. I live in D.C. now, and uh, I direct something called the Conservation Finance Network, which is based at the Conservation Fund. Um, I've also just recently joined the development committee of the Three Valley Conservation Trust. I'm really excited to get involved with a place that's very near and dear to my heart where I was raised. Um, also, must credit um, Yellow Springs, Tecumseh, and Antioch. I came to Camp Glen Helen when I was in middle school, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, so really, you know, there's just, it's, it's a whole lot of fun to have an excuse to come out here and talk about something that I think is really important to everybody's day-to-day -day work that I've done, which is funding and financing for conservation. Um, so Andrea and I have talked about splitting. We've got an hour. Uh, I'm going to talk about just generally the menu of funding and financing options. Uh, and then Andrea is going to talk about one very special entree on the menu, and that is borrowing money or bridge financing. So I'm going to try and keep myself to 20 minutes. Uh, I think you're going to do the same. And then we will, yeah, so I'll have a big hook, we'll put it aside. Um, but that will allow us to spend um, what I think is a meaningful amount of time at the end then for our conversation discussion, um, going a little bit you know, into questions and beyond. So what is the Conservation Finance Network? Uh, we are a nationally networked community of practice, to use the jargon term, um, but basically we're kind of a um, central hub and meeting point for anyone, any practitioner interested in figuring out how the heck are we going to fund and finance conservation work. Um, we typically focus a little beyond the traditional realm of gifts and grants uh, and really looking at how do we get really effective finance mechanisms and even some of the more innovative approaches, uh, like those examples we've heard about today from other speakers, Angela, uh, I think her program is one in particular. We heard from Sandy today on some innovative structuring for the credit union. Um, so I'm going to attempt to outline kind of the broad ecosystem of funding and financing in 20 minutes or less. We'll see how we do. <coughs> so why does this matter? Well, uh, this is a pretty recent 2016 picture of annual home property giving in the U.S. And if you look at it, you'll notice that environment slash animals is kind of way down at the bottom. Um, so 3%, that's, that's the time and attention that we get from people's philanthropy. Uh, when people open their wallets, first they're going to get to religion or health or education. Uh, and then environment and animal welfare is at the bottom with about 11 billion dollars total every year. Uh, we know that we need a whole lot more than that to do conservation work. Um, although there is a little silver lining that is for 2016, um, this subsector of environment and animals saw the most growth of giving in any sector up here, about 7.2 percent. So it's good, but it's not good enough. Um, so this is our quote unquote everything slide. The point of showing this to you, other than getting you to squint real hard, is basically just to say there are a whole lot of tools for the tool kit. Uh, I think people in here, people we've heard from today, people who are attending this to learn more, have heard of a couple of these, have certainly used some of them. Um, but the point here is that there are a lot of options. And the Conservation Finance Network, my role is to try and help educate, capture insight, uh, train people on how to make use of some of these. So that's the same information, um, but if we boil it down to those things that people probably attempt most frequently in their work, we plot this on kind of a growing headache slash migraine scale, <laughs> along with how much money is available. So um, the point of this slide is go for the cheapest and easiest money first. Those things on the left do delve into traditional gifts and grants also gets into bargain sales, seller financing, transfer fees, um, some of the better known areas to start when you're thinking a little more creatively about how to fund and finance your 
either fee acquisition or easement acquisition work, potentially stewardship funding, on through to the more moderate column where you start to get into uh, more creative partnerships, um, when you start to get into things like borrowing money to help with the time problem of your work, or on to more difficult things that take quite a bit more brain damage, but do, on the flip side, offer quite a bit more money. Um, so I'm gonna, in the interest of time, glance over very quickly uh, some of the strategies that we think about in creative fundraising, creative ways of accessing people's philanthropy through their wallets. Uh, so voluntary surcharge, uh, what is it? A small surcharge percentage um, or a flat fee added to a transaction. People in the room are probably familiar with Tecumseh's 1% Green Space program, which I think is generated in the order of 87,000 for conservation, 22 of which went into Jacoby Creek, which is great. Uh, so very flexible funding support, operating unrestricted support for the land trust. Um, it's also a group in Colorado that kind of pioneered this technique. They generated about $2 million over the lifetime of the project. Uh, same with the Cherry Republic in Michigan. They're actually a cherry retailer. They do the same on all their purchases, and that goes to support land um, conservation for cherry orchard or other related uh, compatible land use in that part of Michigan. Consumer-driven incentives, or AKA business partnerships. Uh, folks in Yellow Springs may be familiar with Tecumseh's Thirsty Thursdays at the Yellow Spring Brewery, which I did have a chance to taste yesterday. Excellent beer. Um, but there are some creative ways that folks have figured out how to bake into transactional structures, similar percentage or flat fees, um, such as one that I just found out about a couple weeks ago, the National Forest Foundation and REI have a partnership around a credit card where a percentage of every transaction goes to the National Forest Foundation who then manages those funds for forest conservation projects. Um, corporate social responsibility, I think folks may have partnered with a business or corporate entity. Uh, one example I'll just talk to briefly, the Land Trust Alliance is a corporate council, both locally and nationally. They partner with CSX, Patagonia, Pacific Gas and Electric, all around kind of tapping into, um, it, it is more kind of in the philanthropy world, but something that that corporate entity has an interest in uh, related to their supply chain, sustaining kind of their license to operate in a certain community or other motivations. The realm of public funding, so I know folks in the room also have experience with that uh, far more than me. So uh, ballot measures, Butler County, which I'll glance over in a second, was successful in 2016 with the Parks Initiative. I know Tecumseh was looking at a potential ballot initiative here, uh, though Maybe there were a lot of different draws on people's property taxes. Uh, definitely a dynamic to pay attention to when you're trying to suss out uh, the potential for a ballot measure. The one thing to note about ballot measures though, a lot of people get really excited about conservation finance, especially some of the more technical or um, some of the, the newer, more innovative approaches. But by and large, ballot measures still generate one of the greatest sources of conservation funding. Uh, for projects across the U.S. I think in 2014 alone, $14 billion of new conservation funding was created through ballot measures where citizens vote to tax themselves to support conservation. So the innovative stuff is sexy, but ballot measures are pretty effective. Um, so we just try to get that point across. Also, the Trust for Public Land is a uh, member of ours, the Nature Conservancy some of those groups that do help with a lot of the data analytics behind. Um, so Three Valley Conservation Trust and maybe some other folks in the room uh, were involved with or endorsed the Metro Parks issue. Really great, 66% passage. Um, again, funding for conservation. And there's some other underutilized federal sources or maybe less visible to the conservation set. Um, so I just threw a couple up here. There are many more. Um, they do have a couple of resources on that if people are interested. But just to point to some, some other programs where federal funds may be available, things like rural development at AG. Um, we're a grantee of NRCS's Conservation Innovation Grant Program, which is kind of a 
research and development um, funding pot for new strategies or approaches for conservation. HUD has its own community development block grants. Commerce has economic development uh, funds available. Many of those do fund water projects as well. There we go. Um, there are other ways to think about federal funding in public-private cost-sharing agreements. So um, one great example of this, the municipal water supplier in Denver partnered with Forest Service. Each put in $16.5 million to go up in the watershed and do some of the forest thinning that needed to happen to improve water quality and secure it for Denver, and also to um, reduce wildfire risk. So now getting into the, the kind of more advanced stuff people may not be quite as aware of, um, delving more into the debt and equity world. Let's do a quick time check. So I don't mean to steal Andrea's thunder, um, but uh, one of the first things that we always talk about with people is borrowing money. Um, it's often perceived as being far riskier than it actually is. Uh, we've all got student loans, or at least I still do. Um, you know, you might finance the purchase of a car with a car loan. Certainly, many folks have mortgages. Um, debt is a part of how we all live our lives. And it is a really um, interesting and I think important thing for people to consider as a part of their toolkit. So again, this whole presentation is about how do you kind of stock up your toolbox with what you need such that when a priority or a project comes up, you have different strategies to be able to address it. Um, and that's all the fun I would steal from you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we did start to talk about impact investing this morning uh, with the credit union. I found that example really interesting for its local importance, its local significance. It's tapping into local dollars um, for local impact. I think that that's really motivating for a lot of people. You'd love to see your money put to work for good. Um, if you take a step back from kind of this hyper-local example, um, nationally and globally there is big current trend to start thinking about how all of our money, whether it's in retirement accounts or otherwise, can be put to work in a way that is not just for profit, but also is looking for some kind of positive impact on society and environment. Um, and the reason people are so excited about this for conservation, what we know is that we have anywhere between a three to four hundred billion dollar need every year globally for conservation funding. And what we know from slightly dated estimates now, about 2014, is that we only have about $52 billion available. <coughs> so we know there's a significant gap. And why people care about impact investing is, if we were able to um, get even 1% of global assets under management, all of our money, all of everybody else's money that's being managed by someone, uh, if that was able to be redirected into projects that have some kind of a conservation outcome, we might be able to address the shortfall in domestic or international conservation need. Um, and that's you know important unless you think all of a sudden people's charitable contributions, government grants, uh, unless that's going to increase by what a factor of six. So um, there are a lot of constraints to that. Um, it is pretty tricky to figure out how to work with a for-profit investment uh, firm or fund in this case. I think the credit union example is a really key one for thinking about how those dollars stay local and have impact locally. Um, when you start to try and scale those models, there are a lot of complications for where you're able to achieve impact, for how risky a project is, for how you mitigate risk in those projects. Um, but I'll just explain a couple quick examples for uh, some of the broader examples of impact investing um, or investment fund management, which is people who actually get the investment dollars and put them to work somewhere on the ground. So. Um, one to highlight, so this is an agriculture and ranch land investing fund. I think their strategy is interesting, which is why I talk about it. 
Uh, there are other groups that are doing the exact same thing as Black Dirt, or trying to compete alongside them. Um, but just so that folks are aware of what's starting to happen in this space, so Black Dirt is betting that if they are able to purchase undervalued farm and ranch land starting the southeast, I don't, I hope they'll get to the Midwest, but starting the southeast, if they can buy underutilized farmland, if they can improve ranch land and dairy management strategies at scale across their different land holdings, um, they bet that they'll be able to get improved returns from the grass-fed beef market and dairy market, that they will increase soil health, reduce erosion, um, obviously reduce, um, increase grass growth and healthy grasses, and that they will in fact make a better profit than their competitors as a result. So it's an interesting strategy in how they're thinking about um, from a management and operations perspective. And I know that they're working very closely um, with farmers and farm operators in the Southeast as part of implementing this strategy. As they like to say, they don't make money unless they're improving soil health. Um, and if they're not improving soil health, they won't be making a profit. So it's really interesting to see where someone's profit motivations align in a way with conservation. Um, so that's a strategy example. One deal example that I love talking about is a St. Croix Rule Forest, St. Croix, St. Croix Rule Legacy Forest Deal, which is a partnership with the Lime Timber Company and the Conservation Fund. Um, so we heard today about Jacoby Creek going to auction. Um, well, what do you do when nearly 80,000 acres, in this case, they only acquired 72, 72,000 acres goes to auction. And this is intact, contiguous forest land in northwestern Wisconsin. Wow. All right, so the Lime Timber Company, which is a conservation-oriented impact investor for timberland, um, they went in on the bid. The conservation fund provided um, a loan for an option to acquire an easement, which they then executed on 68,000 acres uh, of their parcel. The Lime Timber Company makes their money, makes their profit, by selling the conservation easement, improving forestry management practices, doing FSC certified selective harvesting, um, and ultimately divesting of the land with a conservation restriction, a working forest conservation easement on the property. Um, after the land value has appreciated. So it's a win for them financially. It's a win for conservation in terms of impact. I think there is something like 80 communities whose drinking water depends on this forest, forested land. Um, there are forest and mill jobs that depend on this in terms of local economic development. The outcomes are, are very numerous. Um, and I think what is telling on this project is the ribbon cutting ceremony. Uh, Governor Scott Walker, if you're familiar with him, um, he attended the ribbon cutting ceremony, he cut the ribbon, they were not allowed to use the term conservation, but in fact it was a conservation project. <laughs> um, so carbon credits, I'm probably best suited talking about this offline with anybody who's interested. They're really wonky and kind of strange and um, we could spend the rest of the time talking about this alone. Uh, but just to say that it is really interesting to see some of the growth of interest in carbon markets domestically. Um, and we've also learned quite a bit um, about the wetland and stream mitigation world. My purpose in talking about these two markets, the carbon market and the wetland and stream mitigation market, is mostly to say that um, I'm sure people have read a lot about ecosystem services and what we ought to pay for ecosystem services. And I could not agree more. We really, in our economic system, need to bake in the externalities of um, the environmental impact of what we consume. But for the time being, there are really two large marketplaces where um, those environmental services are actually bought and sold. So where someone is actually making a financial transaction um, in a compliance setting uh, because of that. And that is because of um, Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, and that is because of California um, AB 32, if you've heard about it, it's the enabling authority for the California carbon market. So um, Devin's probably best suited to talk to you about wetland and stream. I'm happy to share what I know about the carbon world and some of the carbon project developers. 
Um, and then there are just some really interesting, creative, sometimes wackadoodle things that people are figuring out how to do to finance, or in some cases fund, and in some cases fund and finance, land and resource, conservation, restoration, and stewardship. One that you may have heard about more recently, it goes by a lot of names. They're kind of intimidating names for my brain to understand. Um, sometimes they're called pay for success. Sometimes they're called outcomes-based financing. Sometimes they're called performance contracting or environmental impact bonds. Uh, but the way that I understand it is it's basically a contracting process where you don't get paid until you deliver results. So if you have a for-profit entity coming in to do some kind of conservation uh, or restoration project or protection project, whatever it may be, they only get paid when you can verify the outcomes. Um, so it links that payment to a quantified outcome on the other side. One example I'll talk about is Hometown for Us, uh, just because I think it is an interesting deal and folks are trying to figure out how you can apply it. Um, this model to things like Angelo was talking about, where you have some kind of a water utility, sometimes a wastewater treatment facility, that's trying to look upstream in the watershed to where they can, in some cases, make um, improvements on farm to conservation management practices. So that's where people are exploring. But the model they're using is this nifty thing that happened in DC with DC Water. So if you're um, an engineer who works for DC Water, you know that if you build a concrete tunnel, you're going to get X number of um, cubic, um, you're going to get your water cleaned. We have a problem in DC where when it rains, it overflows our system. We have a combined sewage system and wastewater system, um, stormwater system, sorry. And when those waters combine and overflow the system that was built over 100 years ago, it flows straight into the Potomac River. So we have untreated human waste flowing right into our river. They're trying to fix it. The way that we usually know how to fix things is by building concrete. Engineers are pretty uncomfortable where you start talking about, well, what if we did it with rain gardens? Uh, because they do have a very important problem they need to fix, and they need to know that it's going to be fixed at exactly the right um, volume of water management. So this nifty deal model came around where um, what if green infrastructure fails? Well, they carved out a small amount of their overall project budget for fixing some of this combined sewage, sewage overflow problem. And they put it to work in rain gardens, bioswales, and other forms of green infrastructure. Um, but what if it fails? Where is DC Water going to come up with the money to fix the problem if they don't get that environmental uplift from the green infrastructure? And they actually figured out how to price and sell the risk of the green infrastructure failing, i.e. the rain gardens don't work, um, through this contracting structure, and they sold it to Goldman Sachs. So if the green infrastructure in DC fails, Goldman Sachs pays DC water, and they can use that money to build the concrete solution. It's an interesting model. A lot of people are trying to figure out how it might apply again, to farmland management for water quality improvements downstream. Um, I think Atlanta's moving on something pretty quickly. A lot of people looking across the Midwest trying to figure out if this model may be applicable. <clears throat> um, and beyond kind of the typical world of funding and financing, there are just some other creative ways that we've seen people be incredibly effective for growing the overall resources that they have to do their work. And one of those is through cross-sector collaborations. Um, so this may be partnering with National Defense through something like the encroachment program uh, that the Department of Defense maintains. This could be through obesity treatment and prevention. Uh, it could be through other health and well-being approaches. Um, and two fun examples of where healthy communities have been the central meeting point for green space and for health. Uh, one's in Alabama, one's in Maine. In both cases, uh, these land trusts were able to use tobacco settlement dollars to fund green space um, and trail development, and usually in a pretty integrated community planning way. So it's fun to see how these greenways have really brought communities together for access, for health outcomes, um, and for uh, conservation benefit as well. 
So I'll stop there uh, and hand things over to my colleague. But uh, in the meantime, I'll just point you to a couple more resources that we maintain as part of our mission to educate, to train, to convene and promote some of these ideas. Um, so we have at any point about 10 or 12 master students who are writing content about the things that you want to know about. Hopefully, that's the idea. Um, and really, it's meant to try and capture insight that is timely and actionable. So financing urban water protection and management, um, or we've covered the DC water deal, trying to get it in layman's terms so people understand what's actually being done and why it's important. Um, we do try and get pieces from leaders in the field, uh, like Mark Tursek, head of the Nature Conservancy, who's written for our site, and some of his perspectives on conservation finance and other leading voices. Uh, we run a webinar series in partnership with Yale, and um, you know it's it's really meant to capture practitioners and get <coughs> like some of the case studies we've heard today captured and disseminated to a wide audience. Um, one really cool thing we've just launched in the last six months now it is a series of toolkits. So if you remember that brain damage slide that we had up there earlier, uh, we're starting on the simple end and working our way up, developing what we hope are easy to use, easy to understand, what is it, what are the pros, what are the cons, where can you learn more information, who's done it, such that you can talk to your boards about it, you can understand it yourself, uh, and hopefully you can figure out whether it's an appropriate tool for your work. Um, and then uh, I'd be remiss if not mentioning Island Press has published a lot of the foundational literature on conservation finance. It's also our original home. We've since, since flown the nest. Uh, but there are still some pretty relevant sources of information in book form. Books still exist. Um, they're still really great for learning. Uh, and probably the one that covers a lot of this content best is a field guide to conservation finance. Um, and whenever you need it, if you use the code CFN, Conservation Finance Network 25, you get 25% 25, 25 off. And maybe free shipping, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> All right. Over to Andrea, who's going to talk a whole lot more about borrowing money. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Krista. Let's get this back to five plus five. <laughs> All right. Significantly <laughs> shorter than my colleague. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Andrea Ferry here. I'm the Conservation Loans Manager at the Conservation Fund. So now that we've received sort of that 50,000 foot level of what conservation fin finance and funding options are, we're going to take a deep dive into borrowing money, which is my forte. Um, so the Conservation Fund has been around since 1985. We have a dual mission of environmental and economic advancement. Uh, we, we've conserved over 8 million acres of property since 1985. Um, the significant thing to note about the Conservation Fund is that we do pretty much everything in <coughs> partnership. We work nationally. We've also administ administered a few loans in Canada, uh, but we primarily work domestically um, with our partners. The core business that we do is very real estate, transactional, conservation acquisition, uh, purchasing land, holding on to it for a short period of time, and then either conveying it to a land trust or maybe the state or federal government, depending on what the property is. So that's really the core um, business, but we also do quite a few other things, as indicated on the slide. Um, so a couple things I want to highlight are uh, Conservation Leadership Network. They do a lot of educational opportunities, bringing various stakeholders together and doing um, like trainings and other sorts of learning dissemination. And then also um, our Strategic Conservation, I just messed this up because they changed their name, Strategic Conservation Planning. Uh, for example, we have a team of GIS analysis that can come out and assist you in mapping watersheds or various farmlands. Um, so we do have a wide variety of programs that the Conservation Fund does, not just real estate, not just loans. We do quite a few other things. And if you have any questions about those programs, feel free to just catch me after the, after the session. Um, I specifically work for our Conservation Loan Program. We have a $50 million revolving fund um, that strictly goes to external partners to help them do conservation and it's a revolving loan fund we've done about 340 loans and in over in 37 states i believe 
Um, and we've really started to ramp up activity within the past couple of years. Uh, this program's been around since 1990, but I'd say probably 80% of the loans that we've made have been within the last decade. Um, so what is bridge financing? It's a type, I believe Lee mentioned this, it's a type of short-term financing. I'm sure land trusts run this all the time. A piece of property comes up on the market tomorrow. I need to pay for it now. I know funding is going to come in within maybe the next three months or one year or three years, but I need to pay for it now. Um, this is when the conservation fund, my program, would jump in and say, we'll provide that short-term financing will work with you to make this acquisition possible. Um, so why borrow money? Um, as we mentioned, it's kind of a scary thing. Why do you want to go into debt? I certainly don't want to be in debt. Um, but as we mentioned, there is that sort of liquidator savings account to pay off our mortgage because then we have nothing left in the bank if a life event or crisis pops up. That same principle applies to borrowing money for land acquisition if you're a small land trust and you have very limited resources in general. Why not borrow money below market interest rate and plan for the future? Um, also, <coughs> borrowing money can help smaller land trusts um, improve their rep reputation and grow internal expertise. I know from our perspective, when we look at uh, land trusts who are borrowing money, we've, we look at whether or not they have borrowed money before, are they sophisticated land trusts? Are they all volunteer? Is it a full-time staff? What, what's the demographics of the land trust? And borrowing money can really help, um, help with that improved reputation. And then also, lastly, uh, fundraising opportunities. We frequently work with borrowers who go, who take out a loan in order to uh, really jumpstart fundraising campaigns. We're working someone, with someone right now in Maine who um, took out a loan, have a very targeted fundraising approach, and they're going up to folks and saying, hey, help us own this property. The conservation fund is willing to help us, but we need it back in our hands, and we need your help and able to make that possible. So it's a really good way to jumpstart your private fundraising campaign. Um, so I'm not gonna read off all of this. I'm gonna circulate the PowerPoint afterwards. I think Lee referred to this as an everything slide, but it's still missing a couple things. Um, this is sort of the high level approach of the types of lenders out there who can assist you with conservation acquisitions. Um, so we have banks, foundations, individuals, and conservation lenders. Conservation fund falls into that conservation lenders category. Um, when we say banks, it's not so much, uh, you know, Sandy's working at the credit union. We're talking about the Wells Fargo's and uh, Bank of America's of the world have that um, a lot more capital. So this is a, sort of a generalized approach for what we're discussing. Um, so I apologize, there's also a typo on here. I must have missed it. Prime lending is actually 4.5%. But this is a really good overview of mission alignment versus, um, versus interest rates. So if we're looking at that <coughs> conservation lender, we're typically below market rate, but we're very highly mission aligned with what we with what um, you all are trying to do. Banks, they may not have as much expertise in conservation, so they're gonna offer higher interest rate. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick sort of pros and cons, if you will, and kind of gloss over some of this, um, because I don't need to read it all up to you, and again, this is sort of high level, so. Um, so if you choose to go with a commercial bank, first and foremost, you need to find a bank that you already have an existing relationship with. That would really help in terms of possibly getting a lower interest rate, or maybe they can offer flexible financing, they can offer you a line of credit. Also, we've had a ton of experience with land trusts who borrow money from a commercial bank or a credit union, and they find local, local board members for, um, to serve on their board. And it's a great, that's a great type of person to have. Someone with a financing background really adds to diversity um, of a land trust organization. Um, also enhanced public exposure. When banks are willing to work with land trust, it makes them, you know, generates goodwill within the community. So it's a really um, good win-win situation for everyone. Um, some commercial bank constraints. Um, again, they have less, less, less flexibility on terms. I can speak from the conservation lender perspective, the number of times that people don't pay us back in time, we're like, nah, well, <laughs> you're gonna pay us back eventually, right? We're willing to work with you. Banks don't really have that willy-nilly attitude that Andrea Ferry has. 
Um, if you default on a loan, they will charge you extra fees. They will increase your interest rate. Um, also, not to mention the significant quote-unquote brain damage that it is that there is for the land trust. If you are charged a 10% interest fee because you missed your payment by a day, that's significant capital um, that the land trust is missing. <coughs> and again, banks aren't as familiar with the conservation mission, typically um, uh, resulting in higher interest rates. The origination process may not be quick enough for a project need. I was talking over dinner yesterday, the quickest we've ever, the conservation fund has ever turned out a loan is 11 days. It may take a bank 11 days just to respond to that original request. Um, so these are a few things to think about. Um, so we're going to jump over into types of lending that you can get from foundations. So I believe we mentioned this a little bit. Um, program related investments are a type of lending from foundations. Um, they're basically a low interest loan. Uh, they're excellent foundations that are legally required to give out 5% of their endowment every single year, um, typically with grants, but also program related investments count towards that 5%. So it's a win-win, they get to distribute 5% and they're also getting that money back plus you know, the 1% or maybe one half percent interest um, that the borrower has. Um, so again, the foundations are motivated to make these sorts of loans. Um, it's highly mission aligned. And then also being able to, uh, if you're a borrower and you have a PRI and you're able to pay that back successfully, it's proof of concept for a lender. When their foundation sees it, it's proof of concept, great, they're doing excellent work, they can pay us back, we're responsible, we're not gonna give you a loan, just take our money. And that's very, uh, very common as well. Some of the constraints are that foundations don't work everywhere. They might have a very specific mission, they may only give for land acquisitions in the state of California, completely making this up by the way. <laughs> and they can't loan money to anyone outside of that geography. Um, so it's very important to do a lot of research, talk with foundation officer, and see if that's something that might fit their, might fit their portfolio. Also, um, there, some foundations may not allow for the borrower to use raw land as collateral. For example, the Norcross Foundation, which operates um, here in Ohio, but I believe they're headquartered out in Massachusetts and they do some New England work, you cannot use raw land as collateral for a loan. So when you're doing a land acquisition, kind of a big problem. Um, for the conservation fund, for, yes, raw land, that's exactly what the type of collateral that we want. Um, so that's just another thing to take into consideration. And again, they may not be able to act quick enough for what, um, for what you need. Um, so jumping over now to opportunities with individual lenders. Um, these two terms, seller financing and individual lenders, kind of go hand in hand. Uh, seller financing is, I have a property, you want to buy the property, I'll just loan you the money and you eventually pay it off over time and now it's your property. Individual lenders, be that third, you be a third person over here um, loaning money to other person to pay me back. I don't think I'm explaining that very well, so. <laughs> Um, feel free to catch, catch up with me afterwards. Um, but they may be able to move quickly, typically below market rate. Um, and it's also an excellent way to engage with your community. If there is an individual lender out there, maybe you can recruit them to your board. Maybe they're just gonna make a donation to your organization. It's a great way to get out there in the community and really identify uh, new lenders. Um, some of the constraints are limited personal financial resources. I don't know about you guys, but I don't have a million dollars sitting in my bank account. Um, I have significantly less than that. So if it's not enough to finance your acquisition, you may need to pull multiple people. Um, that just makes things very complicated. It's very tricky. If someone forecloses on the property, knock on wood, who gets the property? It, just, it really just overcomplicates things and it may damage historically good relationships. If you can't pay, if you're loaning money from a dear friend and you can't pay them back, um, that's gonna severely damage that relationship. And then this last bit, see treasury regulation section. Um, that just means that if you're loaning money, um, up to $250,000 is exempted and not deductible. Anything over $250,000, if you, even if you haven't received an interest payment, 
um, the IRS is going to tack on that federal interest rate and, and say you did. So it, it can overcomplicate things from a personal financial perspective. Um, so now we're going into what I know best, which is <laughs> conservation loans. Um, so here's a quick map of um, the types of conservation lenders that are out there. That red is Resources Legacy Fund, focusing primarily in the west, um, and then the Open Space Institute on the east side. The Conservation Fund, again, we work all over the country. We've done loans in 37 states. In Canada, we will work anywhere. Um, but this is a good breakdown of some of that um, some of the competition out there, if you will. <laughs> Here in Ohio, uh, the Norcross Foundation works, and then there's also, who I mentioned earlier, loans up to $250,000, and then also the Access Fund, but that's specific towards like climbing activities. So it's a very specific niche, um, which means that the Conservation Fund has the rest of the state perfect. <laughs> um, so the benefits of working with um, groups like the Conservation Fund, uh, we're highly motivated to help you. We're not a bank. We're in, we're in the business because we want to help make conservation happen. We're not here to make money off of people, which is why we can offer such low interest rates. And we are also able to provide a ton of technical assistance. We frequently run into um, obstacles where borrowers can't pay us back because uh, their fundraising plan A fell through. Now we can work with our development team to help the borrower come up with a fundraising plan B. Again, we're not trying to make money off of anyone. We're really just trying to make conservation um, make conservation happen. Um, and again, I think I mentioned, yeah, definitely mentioned earlier, we can work very quickly. Our record is 11 days from first phone call to money going out the door. We have a loan committee that meets once every three weeks. And for urgent acquisitions, we can do something as quickly as humanly possible, as long as the borrower um, can work with us. For example, they have the phase one ready to go, an appraisal, they have all the due diligence that we need, as long as we have it, I really, we really only need two, maybe three days to make a loan happen, so we can work very quickly. Some of, our, some of the constraints of working with a conservation lender is that maybe they don't have enough capital. Um, conservation Fund has $50 million, which is significantly higher than some other groups out there. Um, and uh, our biggest constraint is that we can only loan for a short period of time. Our typical loan term is three months to three years. Um, a lot of groups need extensions beyond that, and we're willing to work with the borrower to make that happen. Um, but we'd also work with the borrower to help them refinance if we're running into some really just big issues that we, we can't overcome it. Um, so ideally, we're, our loan terms are three months to three years. So important questions as a borrower to ask the lender. Um, first and foremost, do you lend to acquire raw land uh, conservation easements? It's really important to understand what a lender can and can't offer you. How long does the underwriting process take? Uh, what are the fees? That's really where commercial banks get you. There's origination fees. Uh, there are prepayment penalties if you sign up for a five-year loan and you pay it off in four years. So it's really important to understand what are all the associated fees with taking out a loan. Do you have a minimum max loan term? What's the payment schedule? What's the loan to value ratio? Um, collateral requirements and that interest rates. I mentioned earlier prime right now is four and a half percent. Some of the loans that I've seen come through people are refinancing um, from a bank and it's eight percent. So that's significantly higher. <coughs> Excuse me. And questions that lenders, so me for example, are gonna ask you is how much do you need, when do you need it, for how long, what's the repayment plan, and what do you have for collateral? These are all factors that we take into consideration um, in determining whether or not we will issue somebody a loan. Okay, so I wanna go into Kind of example, I've been talking a while, so I want to put things up here in the bullet point so you can see what a typical loan looks like. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Western Reserve Land Conservancy here in Ohio, which I believe is out near Cleveland. I had to look that up on the map because my geography of Ohio is below part right now. <laughs> um, used a conservation loan to acquire 239 acres. The loan amount was $1,095,000 
Purchase price is 1.1 million. Fair market value is 1.5 million. That's a loan to value ratio of 73%, which is great. That's ideal. We typically look at loans at 80% or less. Those are perfect. That's right in our wheelhouse. Anything over 80%, we're going to look at, okay, well, what type of project is this? How, uh, what's the ecological value? We're going to look at more factors, but 73% gold stars. Loan term, two years at 2.5%. This was in 2014, so uh, interest rates were significantly lower at that time. Um, the collateral is a deed of trust on property and a letter of credit from Key Bank in the amount of $500,000. So I think this is, and the repayment strategy is private fundraising. So the important thing to notice here, I said the loan to value ratio is 73%, but they're loaning almost 100% of that purchase price. So although the deed of trust is more than enough to be, the deed of trust on property is more than enough to make us feel satisfied with collateral, we're loaning you almost 100% of your purchase price. We need a little bit more to know that um, if you default, then we'll have enough to, we'll have, um, we're 100% secure in our investment. So those are just a few different things that we look at. All right, so I think that's my last slide. Um, here's our contact information if you want to follow up with us. But we have 20 minutes for questions if anyone um, has a question. We are going to stand up here again too. What type of appraisal do you have to have? Are you okay with a licensed realtor's um, opinion of value, or is it a full-fledged Ulta kind of appraisal? Ideally, a full-fledged appraisal. Again, it depends on the property itself. Um, but Yellow Book appraisals, uh, we really appreciate narrative appraisals. Um, it's, yeah, a, an opinion of value to typically wouldn't be sufficient, but it depends, again, on the type of property that it is. Follow up. So if it was a small parcel, say like an under fifty thousand dollar transaction, would a realtor, you know, like we had, we were approached by the Buckeye Trail mm -hmm. folks about a very small piece that was like kind of could have been a key piece mm -hmm. for connecting. I think it was like twenty five thousand dollars. Okay. So it's just not worth it to do a full appraisal. Yeah, that's yeah, that's pretty small. Um, those. So the situation that you're bringing up, those are typically at our attorney's discretion to say yes or no to. Um, the answer is yes, we need appraisals for everything. Yes, we need phase ones for everything. But also we look at the entire situation and it's really at our attorney's discretion to say, yeah, I feel good enough about this. Um, so it may be that you don't need a full appraisal, but we need a letter of opinion plus, you know, 25 pictures of the property or a second letter of opinion, um, that's kind of hard to answer. I've got a question. How, how is the conservation fund funded? <laughs> um, <laughs> everything. <laughs> um, so I can speak specifically to the loan program. Um, we do have quite a few different programs, um, but our loan program is funded primarily through foundation grants, so about half, we have a $50 million revolving fund, about half of that is foundation grants. The other half is liquid capital that was hanging out, not hanging out, that's not a professional thing to say. <laughs> it was sitting in a bank account, and our it's board discretionary, so our board of directors said, we have $25 million sitting here, let's put it to work. Um, so it's what we call working capital. <coughs> Um, so we got 25 million from the Mott Foundation primarily, and then we have uh, working capital, and then we generate as a program a little over a million dollars in interest um, a year, and that's unrestricted revenue that goes back to other programs at the conservation fund. Um, do you want to? Yeah, I can take a yeah. stab at that one too. So one of the interesting things about the conservation fund is it's an incredibly flat organization with a number of different business units. And each business unit has a little bit of a different business strategy behind it. Um, so I think that's a great picture of the loan fund and using both um, 
you know, philanthropic capital from a foundation as well as working capital from the organization's balance sheet. That's not uncommon for some of the other program areas too. In some cases, they're actually fundraising investment capital and putting it to work through other programs. In some cases, it is grant support, foundation support, individual giving, corporate partnerships. Um, we've got a partnership with U-Haul. Anybody rented a U-Haul in the last couple of years? Anybody notice when you check out that they ask you to donate to the conservation fund? Um, so those types of partnerships help to give the kind of capital uh, that then can be leveraged on the balance sheet of the organization to do really cool things like create a revolving fund out to external land trusts and other conservation organizations to solve this time challenge of when somebody's got a parcel they need to sell and you may have limited resources to acquire it. So that's, I think it's pretty baked into the DNA of the organization to try and be really efficient, not just with our own working capital, but with uh, funds raised privately or elsewhere. One thing to note, if I can editorialize on the loan program, and I have to fess up that I just joined the loan committee, um, so maybe that's a conflict of interest in endorsing, but anyways. Um, so, um, Andrea and her colleagues of the loan program are really keen on providing technical assistance, uh, in some cases emotional support, for some of the projects that you may be working on. It doesn't always end in a loan. Um, some projects may not be appropriate, but man, there are some top-notch folks that are here to help. And they're really keen on trying to figure out how to achieve conservation and what financial resources might they have to help with that. But um, I couldn't stress more that the, the mission alignment when it comes to a conservation lender is really important. I mean, I think you've heard that in some of uh, Sandy's remarks from earlier today that the mission alignment of being able to make a positive impact in the community for um, land conservation through the uh, credit union was really key. I think, I think those types of dynamics are incredibly important to pay attention to when you're considering these types of strategies and when you go to talk to your board about them. So mm -hmm. that's my editorial for the day. What's the default history on the loan? <laughs> Um, so officially one. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we do have a lot of loans that people like, make. You know, they miss a payment, but we're not going to default them. Our um, statement is that we, if someone misses a payment, then they're charged 10% on the outstanding principal balance. I cannot think of a single time where we've actually acted on that. Um, so that aside, <laughs> technically one. Um, the organization actually just went belly up. So they, it wasn't so much they couldn't pay us back, it was that they dissolved as an organization. Um, so it was a relatively small loan, so we didn't lose very much, but it was, it was a charge up. And what happened to the property? That is a great question. There was, <laughs> there was a little bit more going on. Um, the executive director of the Conservancy was actually embezzling some of the funds. So I think it's in the property of the federal government at the moment. <laughs> um, so it's a little complicated. So I cringed a little bit when you asked. I was like, well, one technically, but <laughs> there's a very big but there. Um, so yeah, we did not have the property. We only, I think it was a 250-ish thousand dollar loan and we received maybe 80 of it back um, and then we wrote off the rest. So it wasn't significant, but it's uh, there's a little more going on there. <laughs> Well, and I'll, I'll layer on to that. Uh, first, don't embezzle, and second, um, so maybe a, a less um, idiosyncratic example may be that something changes about your repayment strategy. Uh, so I don't want to share too much about this such that anyone can figure out who the organization was, um, but it's an organization we're a big fan of. Um, They've actually been through the Conservation Finance Network's training courses. They became a borrower to do a really cool project, and an external dynamic just completely annihilated their ability to repay their loan. And it was like such a surefire win that that funding would be secured and that they would recoup, um, that they would get the funds to be able to pay off the loan. And it just, it was such a significant and stressful delay for the organization. It put them in a position where they almost couldn't meet their payroll anymore because they were so cash strapped trying to meet the repayment. 
And it was stressful for folks, but um, a lot of time and attention went into it on the part of the conservation fund, on a part of the development department, on part of the attorneys, um, and the land is still conserved. So um, I think it took, it took some strategy around who could come in and then help alleviate some of the conservation funds need to get the money back. I think they refinanced with some private donors and some other sources. But ultimately, conservation was achieved. Um, and it's a really, really important uh, parcel. And in this case, has some pretty significant riparian restoration components associated with it. So yeah, OK, you know, extenuating circumstances do happen. Um, but again, I think the difference is when you're, you're working with a conservation lender, everybody has the same goal as far as the outcome. Um, it sounds to me, I'm uh, sure I'm quite wrong, but it sounds like the documents that would be attached to the easement in terms of um, the restoration plan, management plan, um, the uh, legal description, etc. That that would become part of the loan document. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we have a very extensive due diligence review, uh, plus um, some of the documents that you mentioned. Again, depending on the type of property that it is. Um, so standard documents are going to be the appraisals, phase ones, uh, financial statements, 990s, etc. And then depending on the pro what type of project that it is, we'll um, add on addition, additional documents, um, like the ones you just mentioned. So if there's a grant agreement, we're going to want to see the grant agreement. OK, but at the end of the day, there's no legal document that is recorded in the county, at the county uh, auditor's office that says this parcel of land is protected under an easement. It stays as a loan document. Is that correct? It, it doesn't I, sound to me like a real estate agreement, and it is a real estate transaction. Mm -hmm. You do, do an easement that it gets recorded. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a really, you really do no kidding, but it's something. I don't have a great answer to that. Okay, <laughs> let me, we'll let it let me okay. stop there. But, yeah. but the overarching ag agreement, what was your reference term for that? The oh, I was just using a grant agreement as an as an example. Okay, but um, is the grant agreement is it? I, I come from the military. Is it like a military uh, memorandum memorandum of understanding or agreement, which really has no teeth? Right, but that's um, that would be a part of our, our internal review um, when we decide to make. I'm re referencing our internal review when we decide to issue a loan. Those are items that our real estate attorney will look at before it goes to the loan committee who says yes or no. Um, so I was just referencing a grant agreement as an example because we work with a lot of land trusts that are purchasing. Um, they're buying land. The state will take it off their hands. Uh, we want to see the grant agreement between that land trust and the state saying that they're interested in buying that property. Again, that's just a part of our internal review, just so we understand um, that we will eventually be getting paid back at some point. Yeah, so just again, you know, it's a layer on. Um, is this picked up by the mic if I shout that later? Anyways, um, if you have a grant agreement in place, but the funds aren't going to come until later, uh, if it's a private foundation, their board has met and decided that this allocation of capital will occur. There's just a time lapse in your ability to pay someone for the land, right? So that's where some of the shorter term bridge financing may come in. Um, yeah. yeah. And then there, you would end up with a conservation easement probably on that property that is recorded and will travel with the property, whoever ends up owning it, but you've got an end user owner in mind. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, I'm curious about the uh, the sweet spot for, for magnitude of loans. You mentioned the conservation financing. Think about it, 100 million or less. I imagine at some point it gets too small to be worth the organization's worthwhile. Yeah, so it's never not worthwhile. Let me <laughs> let's correct that. Um, what we typically look at are loans of a minimum of $200,000 um, and ranging 
up to the biggest one we have out the door right now is actually 4.3 million. Once we get over that $3 million threshold, we as a loan committee vote yay or nay, but also it goes to our board of directors of the entire organization to say yes or no. Um, so there's that double layer. But we always look at projects, we look, we'll look at anything, frankly. We just issued a loan two weeks ago, that's $108,000. And depending on, so a really good example is a group that we're working with in New York, upstate New York, and they're purchasing a bunch of small properties. Um, so the most recent one was, I believe, $50,000. One before that was thirty-five. They did a $10,000. In that situation, we would issue a line of credit. And we would just say, your line of credit is $500,000, three-year loan term, use it as you wish. Um, so again, it kind of depends on the types of properties, but um, if it's just a standalone, let's say it's a $30,000 loan, like we'll still look at it, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. I was just wondering if you got examples of um, situations where the conservation fund worked with an organization and then that led to positive changes in terms of the, the direction of that organization. It was where that was a critical piece. A success story. <laughs> it's a success story. Oh no, I wish I should have, I wish I should have prepared myself. <laughs> Um, so actually, we're working with a few um, a few borrowers right now that are doing um, uh, their uh, indigenous and they're reclaiming their ancestral land. So that's near and dear to my colleague's heart. Um, she's been great about finding some of those projects, but we just closed one about six weeks ago. And it was a $1.6 million loan. This group, it's a nonprofit. We will we'll lend to nonprofits. We can't loan to individuals. Um, um, so I should have said that earlier. Um, but the purpose is to reclaim their ancestral land in Alabama. And that's just like so like touching, you know? <laughs> um, but there are quite a few success stories. I could talk about that. For days. <laughs> well, and one of the most prolific borrowers, so there's a group that started doing this um, in New England, and they kind of dipped their toe in the water with using bridge financing as a technique. And I think to date they've now done, I don't know, 40 plus loans mm -hmm. with the loan program. Mm -hmm. So it's just become a way that they do business. Uh, their donors know that they're going to go out and acquire something and then hit the donor base up for money. It's communicated very well in marketing materials and development materials, and it's just now part of the way the, the organization does their work. Um, so they're, they're pretty quick and nimble as a result. Yeah. Um, can local governments borrow money? We have. It's typically uncommon, but yes, local governments, municipalities, um, it's a smaller number, um, but we absolutely will. I would say our, our pretty much our only like no like off limits is going to individuals that gets too complicated legally. Any other questions? Okay, you're far from the mic. I can't throw this one. Is somebody able to throw that one? All right, Glenn. Give it a try. You might need to. Oh, I'm pretty close. Here we go. I'm going to need to check. There you go. All right, go. Oh, there you go. Sorry. How do you volunteers uh, develop expertise in what you're uh, talking about because um, I, I hear some familiar things in terms but then when I look at um, a nonprofit organization I think wow does this need somebody who's um, for example what is your background and so I guess those are two questions what, is, what are your own backgrounds and what would you say that um, uh, an or a nonprofit needs? Uh, what kind of experience and knowledge do they need to do this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my personal background is, um, is conservation. It's not finance. This is not at all anything I went to school for. <laughs> um, I did my master's degree in environmental policy, so this is an easier transition. So I'm using that same like, analytical skill set. Um, so I've actually been in this current role for only six months and it's just been an exponential learning curve for me and I've learned a lot and coming out and talking to, to folks like you um, really helps
helps to build that knowledge base of more conservation, because it's one thing to sit in an office in Arlington and talk about it, it's another thing to come out and really see it. Um, in terms of how volunteers build their expertise, I think Lee can probably talk about this better, being on the development committee of our local land trust. Um, but it's great to have a diverse board. If you remember on my uh, slide earlier, working with commercial banks and recruiting board members, having that kind of expertise is excellent um, for local land trusts, which are typically going to be more conservation focused. And this is a little, you know, might be a little bit out of your wheelhouse if you don't have that financial background. So recruiting people from a wide variety of sectors will exponentially help the organization. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just speak a little more on the notes of the how you can kind of increase your own understanding of some of this stuff. Um, Andrea and her team have a lot of resources for borrowing specifically. Uh, they have an entire glossary of terms explained in plain English for some of what you hear in the debt financing world. Um, I, I just always try to remind people, like, finance as a language was invented to intimidate people. So <laughs> once you kind of brush that by the wayside, I think anyone with a, um, who's, who's understands how to do acquisition, <coughs> whether it be simple or easement, I mean, you're totally sophisticated in, in how to fund and finance these deals. Um, you know, we were started as an executive training opportunity for professionals working on land and conservation projects. Um, after a few years of that course, trying to figure out not just what is conservation finance, but how could professionals, land trusts, uh, foundations, private sector people calling from Wall Street, trying to figure out how to get involved with their skill sets of conservation. Um, it's really meant on how they could apply some of these tools and techniques to their work. So the Conservation Finance Network evolved out of this one week long training course. We still offer that training course um, we're actually fully subscribed this year, so I'm like hesitant to talk about the thing you can't do this June. But um, we do webinars. We have these toolkits that we've launched. Um, it's really meant on trying to put in pretty plain and simple English how people can start to figure out whether these strategies are appropriate to work in mission. Yeah. All right. If there are any other questions, we're on time still. They have a hand for the speaker. I actually got the recommendation of, of Lee's name to, to bring these guys here from somebody who went to the